Well, hello and welcome to Genesis chapter 25. We're looking at the first couple of verses that deal now with the end of Abraham's life. And as we come to the reading, I'm going to pause in a moment so the reading can come up from Genesis 25, 1 through to 9. But the topic we're going to look at is the topic of legacy. And what sort of legacy did Abraham leave and why? And therefore, what type of legacies do we want to leave in our own life? And what we're going to do over the next uh, couple of weeks is look at the legacy of Abraham within the rest of the scriptures, specifically the New Testament. And that'll be a great time for us to reflect upon uh, the promises that God made through Abraham and how they were fulfilled within the life of Jesus Christ, how they're relevant for the church during the time of the New Testament and also for us. But as we pause and you hear the reading, I want us to reflect on what type of legacy did Abraham leave and also, what type of legacy do you think we would want to leave for our own families and our friendship groups? Genesis chapter 25, beginning at the first verse and reading until the death of Abraham at verse 8. Abraham had taken another wife whose name was Keturah. She bore him Zimram, Jokshan, Midan, Midian, Ishbak, and Shua. Joshan was the father of Sheba, and Dedan, the descendants of Dinam, were the Asherites. Then the Tushites and the Lumites, the sons of Midian, were Ephah, Ephur, Hanok, Abida, and Eldar. All these were descendants of Keturah. Abraham left everything he owned to Isaac, but while he was still living, he gave gifts to the sons of his concubines and sent them away from his son Isaac to the land of the east. Abraham lived 175 years. Then Abraham breathed his last and died at a good old age, an old man and full of years, and he was gathered to his people. As that reading finished, interspersed through that reading are not merely the names of people that are hard to pronounce and you've never heard of. The main thing about the story is the, are the legacies that Abraham left. There are a couple of different types of legacies that Abraham left, and we may be similar. The first is materially, and we pick them up quite easily. He left a legacy of an inheritance in terms of material provisions for all the children that he had, whether they were Ishmael, Isaac, or the children through Keturah. And he left them material possessions which demonstrated to him and to his family that God blessed him. And those come out not merely with the material possessions, but in terms of old age that was mentioned in the text as well. And we may think about that ourselves. Often people in our family groups have worked hard to provide for us as we live, and they also wish to provide a legacy or an inheritance for us when they pass. Now, there's nothing wrong with that, but that's not the main legacy that Abraham is known for, whether it's in Genesis 25 or in our New Testament readings to follow. The main legacy is twofold. It is firstly emotional legacy or relational legacy, and part of that is a scriptural legacy. The relational legacy that he leaves is a relationship with his uh, child Isaac, with Ishmael, and with the other children. When it looks like in the text that he sends them out in order that they don't fight, that's not quite true. Because the promise is to Isaac, then he wants to provide for his other children, and so they go to other lands in order to have territory there as well. But a second part of that is the scriptural legacy. Because they are not children of the promise, children who will be raised up to follow the Lord, the one true God, then the main scriptural legacy is for Isaac. The main relationship that he holds is with Isaac. Now that is not saying that we should have a legacy of only caring for children who actually worship the Lord. Of course not. In this context, he knew that the promise was actually going to be fulfilled through Isaac. And therefore he provided for all these children, but he provided the blessing of the fulfillment of the promise of land and a wife, as we know with Isaac, to actually enable that promise of God to come true. So the legacy that Abraham wanted to see fulfilled was the promise of God to provide a place for God's people, a blessing to the nations, which would include his own family in and around that area. And so Abraham was wanting God's promises to be fulfilled. And so he lived to make that happen. And so the question becomes for you and I, are our relationships with those around us wanting the legacy of our own life to be a scriptural legacy? That is the growth, conversion, and also future 
growth and conversion of grandchildren that flow from our own families? Do we want our legacy to be a relationship legacy, a scriptural legacy, or a material legacy? Now, they don't have to be all antithetical, but if you put one above the other, and it's not right, for example, if you put a material legacy above relationships, then I suspect your children may not thank you. They may thank you that you've given them lots of money or an inheritance, but the relational legacy is the key one. But if you leave a relational legacy of being a good mate or a good uh, friend to your children, all well and good. But wouldn't it be better if you left a scriptural legacy, that is a raising of your family, in order that they have the best possibility of living out the promises of God through their own life. Wouldn't that be amazing? In the next couple of weeks, we're going to look at those legacies as they're displayed in the New Testament, which means we're going to look at all the passages of Abraham, specifically in the New Testament, that are outworkings of the promises that God has been living through the family of Abraham from Genesis 22 to 25. Amen.